forward with the lights. Okay, so this afternoon we're going to talk about uh, a variety of strategies that can be used to help parents uh, with children. And we're also going to talk a bit about uh, when the kids get to be teenagers, uh, how that approach may vary a bit. So um, the, the strategies that we used are based on the book Children the Challenge. Okay, and so um, in your binder, you have a handout on page 55 that talks about 37 different strategies that can be used in working with a family. I use these all the time. And so we'll talk about them a little bit, and then we'll even maybe talk about uh, some problems we can think of and how we might approach them. One of the most powerful is action, not words. Because as we talked about earlier, parents, and particularly moms, tend to talk too much. And so if, they, if you can come up with some kind of action they can take, instead of talking, that can be very effective. Now, keep in mind that there's not just one way to deal with the behavior. Sometimes I will give parents two or three different ideas and ask them which one they think they feel most comfortable using. And so they pick one, and then it's most likely to be effective. And you notice this morning when I was uh, talking to Jen, I asked her which problem was most bothersome to her. And the reason I did that was because that's the one where the parents are most motivated to work on the problem and the most likelihood of success. And so in the very same way, if they can select the strategy that they feel most comfortable with, they're more likely to follow through with it, use it, and, uh, and have success. Uh, and I want you to think as we talk about these about the four goals of misbehavior and which ones would be most effective for which goal. So remember, if it's attention, we don't want to give attention, and attention is face-to-face -face talking. You can take an action uh, and not talk to the child, not even give them eye contact. And that can be very effective. That is not attention. So for example, I had one woman who talked a lot to her child and I told her that I wanted her to take action and the situation was one in which she was going to give the child choices and if the child did the inappropriate behavior, the child would go to their room for 15 minutes and uh, I, and I said that she was not to talk at that time. And what we came up with was that if the child did not respond at the first request, she would then point to the child's room. If the child did not respond by going to the room, then the mother would take the child firmly by the arm, take the child to the room, and she said, oh, but it's so hard for me not to talk. So we talked about that a little more, and we finally agreed that she was going to, I don't remember if it was sing or whistle. Uh, one of those two things, because she thought if she was singing or whistling while she went, then she couldn't talk and whistle at the same time. And so she uh, basically started singing, singing Yankee Doodle went to town every time she talked her, she took her daughter to the room. And that was fine, it worked, and she wasn't giving her daughter any attention. Clearly, she was too busy singing and getting her to the room. And that was very effective for her. So, just to start out with something we've already said, that action is a way of taking care of a problem without giving attention. Okay? So the second one is withdrawing from disturbing behavior. And you know 
which goal that is in response to, right? What one? Power struggle. Always withdraw from the power struggle. Okay, another one is to allow natural consequences to take effect. So, an example of that might be, uh, we're going to have dinner at 6 o'clock. Sometimes kids will dawdle over dinner and try to get their parents involved with them over eating and whether they're done and, you know, they keep talking to them. So, we might say, um, you know, here's the natural consequence. If you don't eat, you get hungry. So, what we're going to do is say, okay, we're going to eat at 6 o'clock. At 6.30, people are done eating. Whether you're done or not, we remove the dishes. If you haven't eaten, you get no, no more food till breakfast. And Drikers used to say, you know, it's only in America that people worry about starvation. These children will not die from having missed one meal. When you think about children in poor countries who have one handful of rice a day and they're still living. Uh, but it's a very, uh, it's a natural way for children to discover if you don't eat, you get hungry. Uh, however, we would not use a natural consequence for if you, uh, if you run into the street, you're gonna get hit by a car, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, natural consequence. Well, where the health and safety of the child is concerned, we are not going to use natural consequences. So we have to come up with logical consequences. Logical consequences catch the word logical. Their consequence has to have something to do with the misbehavior. So one of the things that was mentioned this morning by somebody, if you don't put the toy away, the toy is going to disappear for a while. And that's one strategy we've used. For example, children, you might say, okay kids, it's your job to pick up your toys. All the toys should be picked up before you go to bed. Any toys that are still out will be gone for a week. And moms and dads have to basically put put the toys in the trunk of the car, the kids will go hunting and find them. But the point is that they learn that there are consequences for their behavior. They miss the toys. If they don't miss the toys, that's another clue that maybe you got too many toys. If they don't care that they're gone, then it's time to weed out. <laughs> they, and kids, if they have too many toys, they end up throwing out their toys to get to the ones they want. And that's a whole other problem. Uh, so logical consequences, if you abuse the, with a teenager, if you abuse the phone rule, you lose the phone privilege. So let's say, you know, teenage girls in particular love to talk on the phone. And parents might make a rule, okay, you can talk on the phone from on the hour to the half hour, but you must stay off the phone between the half hour and the hour. So other people can call in. We'll tell our friends if they want to call us, call us between the half hour and the hour. But you are to be off the phone then. If you abuse the privilege, then you lose the phone for a day, or you lose the phone for two days or three days or whatever. And we always say start out, consequences are to make a point. It doesn't have to be a uh, long period of time. You're making a point. So start out with a day because then you can say the next time it'll be two, but if you start out with a month, you have no place to go from there. And so we, a lot of times parents get really heavy handed with the consequence and it's going to last a week or three weeks or a month. And we want them to know, you know, make it a small period of time because you're trying to get the point across. But let them know if it occurs again, you'll double the time. So they know it's going to only get worse if they don't straighten up. Um, take time for training. A lot of times parents hold their kids accountable for things without having determined that they know how to do it. It's kind of like announcing that from now on you're going to make your bed, but nobody ever taught them how to make the bed, and then the parents criticize them because they didn't make it right. That's not fair. In one family years and years ago, the kids were hanging up the towels and they wanted a consequence. And the counselor asked, 
it was a, a child, asked the child why he wasn't hanging up his towels. He said, I can't reach the towel rack. The parents had never thought of it. They never checked to see if he could do it before they instituted this rule. So it is important that children get trained. It's like any chore, children have to get trained in, shown how it is supposed to be done and exactly what's involved before you hold them. And you have to be able to see that they can actually do it before you start holding them accountable. So you may have to train them over a period of time. If you want them to put the dishes in the dishwasher, you may have to supervise them a few times until you see that they now know how to do it. Then you hold them responsible for putting the dishes in the dishwasher. Um, we talked this morning a bit about choices. And it's a good thing to offer kids choices, but only offer them choices that are acceptable to you. So you can do this or you can do this two choices, I don't care which one you pick. It has to be choices that you can live with. Because parents will often say, okay, either you do this, or you have to stay in the house after school for the next three days. Well, who's getting punished here? <laughs> Mom. And the kid knows it. And so they think, well, I'll show you, ha, ha, ha. You're gonna have to stay in for the next three days. So only use uh, choices that that you can live with whichever choice they take. Another way of doing choices are to give them choices between the appropriate behavior and the other choice is the inappropriate behavior with the consequence. So it and I always when I'm talking to kids and we set this up I always make it clear here's a choice that is the one you're supposed to do Here's the choice, the one you've been doing before, and the consequence that you will get if you do that choice. And I end it by saying, it's up to you. You get to pick. Which is it going to be? This one or this one? If you pick this one, you're going to be out of trouble. If you pick this one, you're going to have a consequence, but it's up to you. And parents have to be willing to let the kids have the consequence a time or two and now they can stay out of the gym and they could say, I'm really sorry you made that choice. I'm really sorry that you don't get to go out with your friends tonight. I hope that next time you pick a, better, a different choice, the one where you will be able to go out with your friends. So the parent can be very compassionate, very empathetic about, oh, I'm so sorry you have to go through this, but you made that choice. And that's holding kids responsible for their behavior. And we want to create responsible kids, right? They become responsible adults. Um, kids often cooperate. It doesn't look like they're cooperating, but they are. And so, if, for example, when kids are fighting with each other, there's a payoff for everybody. Uh, one child gets a negative payoff. It's the oldest child. They get into trouble. You should have known better. You're the oldest. The younger one bugs the older one until the older one can't stand it any longer and then the older one hits the younger one and the younger one cries and goes to mom and gets attention so everybody gets something out of this you know the older one yes it's negative true um, however uh, they get they get attention for getting into trouble the other one gets attention for getting hurt and so you know, it takes two to fight. And so directors would say, put them all in the same boat. You know, say, uh, you know, if there's fighting, we're going to deal with all of you as a group. Everybody's going to go to their room for 15 minutes. And, oh, it's not fair. And say, hey, can't fight without your cooperation. You don't, if they want to fight with you and you don't want to fight, then go away and don't deal with them. But if you want to stay and fight, then you're going to get the consequence along with the other person. Or you might say, if you come and stand by me and they hit you, then I will hold them responsible because I saw them do it. Um, so that's putting them all in the same boat, is what directors would call that. Um, another one is to stop feeling sorry for the child. Because by feeling sorry for a child, you get them to feel sorry for themselves. 
and then they, it really affects their, their feelings of worth. So if we could take an extreme example, a child with a handicap, you can have two approaches. One, you can do just about anything, you're just going to have to work a lot harder to do it, but you can do it, and you don't feel sorry for it. Or you can have this, oh, you poor thing, you have a handicap. And these are people that become helpless and expect to be waited on and taken care of. And they become, uh, they, they have to be taken care of the rest of their lives. And you may have seen this. You can see two people with the same disability, one very successful and one basically vegetating and having parents take care of them for the rest of their lives. The whole difference is the parents who did not pity the child, but gave the child the courage to do whatever they wanted to do, those are the ones. I don't know if you people saw it, but not too long ago there was a little documentary thing on TV about a kid who had no legs from the knees down and he was on the football team. Literally, he was playing football and he ran on the stumps of his knees. And he was a good football player. He really ran fast. And they let him be on the team, and the, and the kids all supported him on the team. And he was good. But there's a situation where parents said, you know, you have to work harder, but go ahead and try. And, you know, they have to work harder, it's true, but there's a lot of things they end up doing. I knew a guy who had no arms below the elbow, and he was a great uh, golfer. He took up golf and he played a great game of golf with, with doing this, you know. Um, we're going to, uh, family council meetings are another strategy and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Ignoring the behavior is a good strategy if the parent can successfully do it. And I have to talk that over with parents because if they really get bothered by it, the kids know it. They read them. Oh, I'm getting through her. I'm getting through her. So you say, if you can really ignore it and feel okay about that, you know, and say, okay, if they want to do that, I don't care. You know, it's not going to bother me. Then you can ignore the behavior, and if they're doing it for attention, it's not going to work. But if you can't ignore it, that's not a good strategy. And you notice on the tape you saw earlier when uh, Jim Bitter was talking to the mother, when she said those famous words, do you remember what she said? I'll try. I'll try. He said that one's not going to work. I'll try means you don't know that for sure you can do it. And we don't want to give them uh, a strategy that they aren't absolutely certain they can follow through with because they're going to fail if if we don't make sure they know they can do it. Um, do the unexpected. You know, that is a great one, especially for people who can have a sense of humor. Kids are thrown when you do something humorous to address the problem. And it's kind of like, you know, sometimes have you ever gone in and tickled your kids to get them out of bed in the morning? You know, instead of yelling at them or saying 16 times or, you know, doing something they don't expect oftentimes have, has better results. And, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, if you don't get, get in there and get those dishes in the dishwasher, I'm going to hang you from your toes and tickle you until you scream. You know, and they know it's ridiculous, it's impossible, it's silly. But somehow the point gets across when you couldn't get it across by just telling them. You know, it's the uniqueness. Uh, way back when we had a family education center, we had a family, uh, they had a baby and they had a little girl that was um, probably four. And um, every, the, the problem they wanted to address was every Sunday when they were getting ready to go to church, the older child <coughs> would get her clothes on. The mother would be busy getting the baby ready. The father would be busy showering. And this four-year-old had a binky or a blanket that she liked. 
And so while mom is working with the baby and the dad's not available, she goes and finds a diaper pin and she pins her blanket to her. In those days, you know, they dress them up in the best little dress for church. And she'd walk in the room dragging this heavy blanket on her dress. So it's like this, you know, pulling on her dress. And every Sunday, mom says, you know, don't do that. You're going to tear your dress. And then every Sunday, she does it again. And so one of the, what, what we talked about was, can you think of something that you can do about that without talking to her? Maybe something that she wouldn't expect. And so mom thought about it a little bit. She said, well, I know what I could do. And they said, well, what would that be? And she said, well, I could just pick up the blanket and throw it over her shoulder so it wouldn't pull on her dress and just go on about my business. I said, great idea. Why don't you do that? Her daughter never did it again. Once she knew it wasn't going to work anymore, Mom would just throw it over her shoulder and keep doing what she was doing. It was, you know, behavior wasn't working. Um, being firm and not giving in, that's a big one because, well, uh, like um, we talked about this morning, if you get into a power struggle with children and you give in, they discover it works, they use it more, they get stronger and louder and more powerful in their power and it only gets worse. So you have to be firm. And when you say no, that's it. End of discussion. Uh, so another is order. Children don't know how to create order. But we need some kind of order in our family, whether it be routines, certain things at certain times, or keeping order. Uh, chaos is overwhelming and so parents have to teach children how to maintain order and then you know create chores and so the order can be kept uh, another one is never do for a child what they can do for themselves a lot of times particularly with youngest children parents are in a big hurry and they'll do it for the child because they're in a hurry. And then the child learns to expect it. And the bad side of it is they expect it, but at the very same time, what they think you're saying to them is you're incapable of doing this for yourself, so I have to do it for you. And it leads to feelings of worthlessness in the child. Everybody else can tie their shoes, but I can't, so you have to tie them for me. Other kids my age can do it, but I can't. So uh, obviously there's something wrong with me, when actually it's maybe the parent that's the problem because they're doing too much for the child. And I mean, I've known parents who are still dressing their kids when they're five, six years old. You heard about the mom that's still bathing her daughter, some of these kinds of things. Um, we want to know that they know how to do it, and then we want to let them do it themselves. One of the things that Drikers used to say is, you know, when kids really want the responsibility, we say you're too young, and then when they don't want it anymore, then we want them to take the responsibility. And isn't it true? You know, I mean, kids love, I have my grandchildren, you know, when they were three years old, rinsing dishes for me in the sink, because they loved to rinse dishes. You know, and, and then they'd wash dishes in the sink, and they thought it was great fun. Well, you can teach responsibility when they're excited to try these things. Once they know how to do it, you can ha hold them responsible for doing it. Um, lots of encouragement. Uh, this is so huge. It really is. Particularly today in our society, families are so busy that they don't see, don't realize it, but they don't have, uh, take the time to encourage their children, but they take the time to criticize the children for their mistakes. So the children are only hearing the negative stuff. The other thing is to think what the word encouragement means. It means to give courage. When a child says, I can't, they don't believe they can do it, we have to believe they can do it before they'll believe they can do it. 
and we have to encourage them to try and try again until they do it and then we have to let, let them think about how good they feel because they've accomplished something. Uh, weekly family fun time. Now keep in mind some of these, remember I said this morning that we want to extinguish the bad behavior but we also want to give them something that builds relationships or makes the child feel better about their self-worth or helps the child to use um, their behavior in, on a, in a useful way. Okay, so a weekly family fun time is one of those positive things that I recommend to the family. Families don't have family time these days. And it doesn't have to cost a, a lot of money at all. And what we recommend is, even if it's a half an hour, if they all sit down and play a game together, go on a picnic, you know, uh, go for a bike ride, something that's family oriented because parents are scheduling their kids, you know, 24 seven and we're losing touch with connecting as a family. And so asking parents and children together to come up with a list of fun family things they could do together, considering their financial ability. Uh, and then once a week, they're to have a fun family, family fun time. Uh, take time to listen. You know, when kids are upset, sometimes what we really need to do is to just sit down and let them tell us why they're upset instead of reacting to the fact that they're upset. So sometimes kids get angry uh, and we react to the anger instead of finding out why are you feeling angry right now. And so we need to get parents to listen to their children and find out why there is a problem. What is, what's going on and why is this occurring? Because then we're in a better position to decide how we can help them to overcome the problem, whatever it is. Another is give kids responsibilities. What a lot of parents do is they say it's, you know, it's too much trouble because they won't follow through and then I have to bug them or whatever. But giving children responsibilities teaches children to be responsible. And I always remember uh, many, many years ago when I was young, uh, there was a book out that was called Cheaper by the Dozen. And recently there was a movie that was called Cheaper by the Dozen, but it was really not like that, the book. But in the book, the parents were uh, time management experts. And they had 12 children. And so they had everything figured out in a time management way in their family. So every child had a chore. The youngest one who was just barely moving around the furniture was in, in charge of dusting the legs of the chairs. And as they got up, then they had, uh, you know, a, more of a responsibility. But every single child had a responsibility in the family. Uh, teaching cooperation by having it to them do it together. You know, when you team up with somebody, it's much more fun and easier and faster to get something done. So teaching kids by teaming up, they can get things done faster and, and they can feel really good about what they've accomplished. Uh, then establishing rules and sticking with them. And with rules go consequences. You have to remember that. Because it's like, you know, and this is again teaching them for life. Take driving a car. It's a, priv it's a privilege to drive a car, but there are rules. And if you don't follow the rules, you get a consequence, right? You get a ticket if you speed. If you speed again, you get another ticket, but third time, I think it is, you lose your license. And you know, we can learn something from that. We need to show our children that you know the consequences get worse if you continue the behavior. And that's the way the world goes. You look at people who break the law, those are rules. 
First time, they might let them off. Second time, they're going to give them a consequence. Third time, they're going to up it. And we need to d demonstrate to children that this is how our society works. There are rules. You have to follow the rules. And if you break the rules, there's consequences. Uh, develop routines. And I'll tell you, this is huge today. Because we have two parents working, and then the kids have all these activities. And I can't tell you how many families I see where life is total chaos <coughs> in the family because they don't have any kind of set routine. And uh, the other night when we did that schedule, I think you got a sense of how you can create a routine and you discover you can get more done and you have more time to yourself and so on. Uh, children like structure. It, there's a certain sense of security that comes from knowing this is the way it's going to be. Teachers know that, so they create structure in the classroom. The kids always know what's going to happen, what's going to happen then. And families need to create routines as well. Um, avoid power struggles, we've already talked about that. Withdraw power struggles or you give them choices and avoid the power struggle. If you have a child that gets into power struggles, you can avoid the power struggle by setting up choices before it even happens. Because oftentimes we know, oh boy, this is going to be one of those that we're going to have this power struggle over. So okay, I'm going to think ahead and I'm going to think, okay, what choices can I give them? And one of those choices is going to have a consequence associated with it, and I'm going to let them make a choice. Um, decide what you'll do and what you won't do. And so uh, we can't force anybody else to do anything, but we can decide what we will do and what we won't do. So I'll give you an example of a family with a teenager. And this mother was saying, you know, my daughter, this will you'll relate to if you have a teenage daughter. Uh, she has a lot of friends, and she'll come to me at 4.30 or 5 o'clock on Friday and say, Mom, you've got to take me here. Or there, and she, mom would say, you know, I've got things to do. I have plans, and here she is, at the very last minute. And now I've got to drop everything and take her someplace. And I said, well, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get out the schedule on Sunday, and everybody's going to put in anything they need for the whole week. Then the rule is, if it isn't on the calendar by Wednesday, it's not going to happen. I say, you tell your daughter if she wants any. Anything from you, like transportation, it's got to be on the calendar by Wednesday. If it isn't there, sorry, she has to find her own transportation or she doesn't go. And, mom, you know, it's like, oh, okay. And the daughter did it once, came to her on Friday, said, you know, all my friends are going to be over Janie's, take me over to Janie's. She said, gee, I'm sorry, it's not on the calendar. And, of course, she was very upset, but she said, that next Wednesday, she was on the phone to her friends. I gotta know what we're gonna do on Friday, or my mom won't give me a ride. And from that point on, she didn't have the problem. So um, that's how you take care of yourself. Tell the child what you will do, under what circumstances you'll do it, and under what circumstances you won't. Um, so it's like if they want, if you ask them to do something for you, and they say no, say you know, okay. Here's the deal. If I ask you to do something for me and you say no, then the next time you ask me to do something for you, I get to say no. Oh, wow. Well, because I'm, you know, I feel it's that's fair because I shouldn't have to do for you if you don't do for me. Um, remove the child from the temptation instead of the temptation from the child. Either or. Those are, that's for toddlers instead of continually telling them not to play with the glass dish on the coffee table, you either take the child away from the dish or the dish away, put it up higher. Uh, don't talk during conflict, big one. You know, and you can say, you know what, I'm, I'm really ticked right now, we're going to talk about this later. And you go away, you calm down, and you sit down and discuss it with them. Be consistent, we all know that. Uh, minimize a mistake the first time. Identify it as a mistake, something you can learn from. If a mistake happens repeatedly, it's not a mistake, it's a misbehavior. Uh, identify the goal of the behavior. We've already talked about that. Uh, 
don't get involved in children's fights. Let them work it out. Or you can put them in the same boat. Either way. Um, this uh, 30 is so, so, so important. Separate the child's worth from their behavior. Parents so often say, you're such a naughty boy. That's stating something about him as a person. And you have to train the parents to say that is bad behavior. Not label the child as bad. Because that affects their worth. Then they start to think, my behavior determines my worth. Or what you think of my behavior is what determines my worth. And so we want to separate behavior from worth. And this is carried all through adulthood. Once a child believes that their worth is about their behavior, then if they have made mistakes in their life, they start to see themselves as a worthless person. And a lot of our clients, as adults, come in feeling worthless or not very worthwhile at all, or inadequate. Acknowledge the child's accomplishments. You know, kids love to be recognized for their accomplishments, and it makes them want to do more. So if they get recognized for what they do, and you make a big deal out of it, oh, that's really great how you picked up your room, then they think, oh, you like that? Wait till I do it the next time, kind of thing. Uh, avoid, avoid the first impulse. Drikers would say, um, if you don't know what to do, do anything other than what you always do. Because that is what they expect. And if you do anything else, it will be the unexpected. So if you always start yelling at them, do anything but yell. You know? So whatever it is that you always do, do anything but that. And that will throw them off. Because that's what they expect you to do. Take time to plan. Big, you know, with the way schedules are today, with two parents working, kids and activities, parents and children need to plan. And that that is another way that helps there to be order and structure in their lives, and everybody feels more secure because they know what's going on and what's going to happen. Ask only once. This is a big problem, and Jen talked this morning about how she was... Um, asking your kids to do something, and then asking them again, and asking them again, and then yelling. You know, children learn how many times they cannot do it. You train them to wait until you yell. And another story that Drikers used to tell was, and I can't do it with a Viennese accent, but he would do it with a Viennese accent. He would say, I was walking down the street in Vienna, and this little girl was playing hopscotch. She, he was just crossing the street. She was down the street. And he noticed that the window went up in this up, upper level of this apartment building. And this woman yelled down, Mary, come up. It's time for lunch. And this little girl didn't miss a step. She just kept hopping. And so uh, he kept walking. And he got a little closer. And up went the window again. Mary, come up. It's time for lunch. And she never missed a hop. You know, she just kept hopping. So he got up there and he said, excuse me, but is your name Mary? She said, yes. And he said, is that your mom that's been calling you from the window? And she said, yes. And he said, well, why aren't you going in for lunch? And she said, she hasn't called me loud enough yet. And that's the way our kids are. They learn, when do you really mean it? When you really mean it is when you scream. When you say, I'm only going to tell you once, and then I'm going to take action, guess what? They learn to do it when you say it once. But if you will say it 10 times, they will wait 10 times. You train them for how long they can get away with not doing it. Um, affirming the child's value and worth, huge. You want to always acknowledge the value of the child just for being who they are and doing that enough so the child feels confidence. We talk about the vertical and the horizontal plane. We want our children to be on the horizontal plane and to be there they have to feel good about themselves. 
So their main concern is contributing, building their skills, doing the very best job they can, not worrying about whether they fit in, belong, and have significance. And then finally, always talk respectfully and expect that then we can expect the child to do the same. So many times we talk about respect with families. Parents are upset with the children because they're not being respectful. And then you discover that the parents aren't being respectful to the children. And the children are just modeling what they're seeing the parents do. So it has to go both ways. There has to be respect to, towards everybody. And then um, as the kids get older, uh, when they reach 12, and you can do the, you can start this early with children, but it's going to be particularly important when kids hit adolescence. Families need to have a family meeting once a week. And when they have a family meeting, uh, when we start out, we want them to plan the calendar for the week. This is teaching kids structure and how to plan, manage time. It's a very important skill in our society today. Uh, so you're teaching them early. And then uh, we want to plan a fa fun family event. So that's how we get them there in the first place. Our, and if they have chores or allowance to talk about the chores. And uh, you might have them pick their chores you know, kind of an easy chore and a harder chore kind of thing. Um, or, or alternate on chores, you can talk about how to get the chores done. Uh, when there's a problem, you can talk about the problem and get the kids involved in uh, coming up with a consequence for that behavior. So those family meetings are to solve family problems. And just like the counseling session you saw, everybody's involved, everybody is equal. And we talk about the problem, try to find a solution. Everybody can agree to try. And we use the six steps of problem solving. So we brainstorm all the ideas, and then we talk them over and see if we can come up with one that we could try for a week. Even if you end up trying one that the kids come up with, the fact that you were willing to try theirs, and even if you knew it wasn't going to work, they are so much more cooperative about using your ideas after you've let them try theirs. And they've learned that that one doesn't work, so now I'm willing to try your idea. So um, we encourage family meetings to solve problems when you have teenagers. Some of the strategies I mentioned here uh, you could still use with teenagers, but some of them I think you can tell just wouldn't apply, you know, with a teenager. But the family meeting is a way to address problems in the family and involving them in discussing the problems and coming up with the consequence. You get their involvement and you get their, uh, they are more uh, connected and agreeable to what you're doing if they participated in the decision-making process. Teenagers want to be included in the decision-making process. There are going to be a few things that are hard and fast, what we call uh, things that you're willing to go through a meltdown over that are going to be hard and fast rules they don't have any choice about. You know, it's like there's going to be no drinking or drugs in our house, and that's not something we're going to discuss at a family meeting. That's just the way it is. You know, there are a few of those. But other things we can talk about and talk them through and, and Teenagers want to be heard. They want you to understand what it's like from their point of view and why they think the way they do and why they want to do what they want to do. And you have to discuss it. And let's say they want Nike tennis shoes and all the kids in their class have Nike tennis shoes and it's not fair that I don't have Nike tennis shoes. Well, if you talk about that problem in a family meeting and brainstorm how they're going to get Nike tennis shoes, you might come up with a solution where they have to work and make half the money or the money over and above what the cost of the tennis shoes are that you would usually buy. And that teaches them responsibility and a work ethic and they get what they want and and it isn't so expensive for you the parent, etc. So that's uh, that's another thing. So family council meetings are very valuable, especially in the families we're dealing with today with so much going on. And you can have that first family meeting in your office and have it with the family. Let them try it out. And you have to help parents to understand that the parents aren't 
running the meeting. Everybody takes a turn. This is a democratic process. Everybody is equal in this process. And you have the description of how to hold a family council meeting uh, on page 57 of your three ring binder. And you can use it yourself or make copies and hand it out. Okay, I realize we're over time for a break. Any questions about what we've talked about uh, so far? Yes? I have one more quick thing. Um, has there been any studies on daycare providers? Because I know with more parents working full time, the children are being placed with daycare providers. And how is that playing out? Are they still doing these goals? With their providers, they're acting out as if they would with their parents because they're Well, constrained. there are daycare providers and daycare providers. I mean, some daycare providers are very good, and then some are not so good. So, I mean, they're parents too, mm -hmm. and they may or not may not have any training on how to deal with children's behavior. And all you can know is what you hear about how the kids behave when they're at the daycare. And so. Uh, a lot of our children are being raised by daycare. And in that situation, I guess it's really important to know something about the person who's doing the daycare and to ask them questions about how they deal with various behavior problems, just to hear, you know, how they would approach it. Okay? Any other questions? I know you're all ready for a break, so. Okay, let's take a break and. Talk about